Good afternoon. My name is Tim Mayer and I am the Sales and Marketing Director for MDL Marinas. I couldn't be more excited to welcome you to an hour with one of the world's best known sailors, an author, a broadcaster, Mr. Tom Cunliffe. Now, Tom read law at university before running away to sea. After heading up a sailing school in the south of France, he has served before the mast in small sailing ships. He's skippered yachts for private owners. He's raced offshore. He's worked as a sea mate on a coastal merchant vessel and taught sailing and navigation at all levels. He's an y, uh, RYA MCA Yacht Master at Zamana. Tom, it is an utter pleasure to welcome you to um, MDL um, and the screen is all yours. Well, I'm always totally amazed by that, Tim, when you read all that out. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I'm an ordinary guy, folks. Uh, I've just made my way in the world as best I can. And it's a real delight to be with you all today. It's great, really, to just to get together in these difficult times, isn't it? And do the best we can. Um, we've got all sorts of questions coming here, and that's the way we're going to deal with this. I've got pages of them here, but uh, I've picked out a few that I think will be of, of most interest to everybody. So, I'm going to start with one that uh, affects everybody who's cruising far and wide which very much includes me, it's right down to my heart this, and uh, Steve from the East Coast wants to know how has Brexit affected cruising in Europe and is there anything we, we can do about it? Well, Steve, what a question. Yes, it has affected cruising in Europe, hasn't it? In many ways. Uh, if your boat's in Europe now and you want to bring her back, you've got to get her back before next December the 31st or you're going to get stung for paying VAT. Now, if you're like me, you've probably already paid VAT once, so to bring it back in again, get charged again, is just going to fill you with rage and spite. But that's the way it goes, and we have at least been given a year to get them back, so that's something, I suppose. The same thing that's going to make life awkward is the Schengen immigration arrangements. If your boat's in Europe, you can leave her there as long as you like, so long as she was there before Brexit. Um, mine was, and so if I choose, I can keep her in Europe till the cows come home and nobody's going to charge me any money at all. That's fine. It's me that's the problem, because if I want to go into the Schengen area, then I've got 90 days, basically. And if you can work out exactly how that functions. You're a better man than me because I've been struggling to try and work this out. My wife's doing her sums, drawing pictures all over the diary and we can't work out how long we're going to get. We know we get 90 days in 180 but when it starts and when it ends is extremely difficult. Two learned people have tried to explain this and I haven't got to the bottom of it yet. It's a bureaucratic nightmare essentially. It's a lot easier if you want to come here from Europe because you get 180 days in a year and that's it. Couldn't be simpler, could it? But I'm afraid it's not like that for Brussels. So we're going to have to work that out. But I think that in due course, that will get sorted. And I think it'll get easier for us. So right now, the only decision to make is uh, if your boat's in Europe and you don't want to pay VAT again, you better bring her back before the end of the year. The rest of it, really, the best advice I can give you, Steve, and anybody else else that's interested, is go to the Cruising Association website or even better, join the Cruising Association. They are really, really good at this. They've got guys who have worked on it practically full time and they know a lot more about it than I do. So go to the Cruising Association, the CA, and see what they've got to say. The RYA are good too. Stuart Carruthers at the RYA has been working his what's-its off trying to sort it out for us. So thanks, Stuart, and thanks to the CA for giving proper answers, a lot better than mine. Go there and have a look. David from Poole wants to know what's the best piece of advice I was given as a young sailor. Well, that's a hard one, but I think two really. First was this. If you're in a seaway and there's waves and you're trying to work to windward, most boats, even modern boats, will point higher than they'll sail. So don't try and sail too high. If you try and point too high, your boat will slow down, it'll start going sideways. And you'll think you're getting there, but you're not really. The guy who cracks off, maybe even to 50 or 55 degrees, if your boat will point at 45 or 38 or something, bully for you. But when there's a sea running, it's not going to happen anymore. So crack off, let her foot, let her go. You'll have a nicer day and you'll get there quicker. That's the first good bit of advice. The second bit of advice I was given, and this was done uh, when I was setting off across the ocean for the first time, was this. Don't try and point the boat the way you want to go. 
if that doesn't suit the wind. This is really important and it also is important if you're on a relatively short passage. If you're going from the Solent down to the northwest corner of France to Ushant, for example, don't think you've got to point that way all the time. It just doesn't happen. If you can't lay it, there's no difficulty at all. You just crack off and sail the best you can. But if the wind is behind you, as it often is when you go on a passage, because you wait for a fair wind, don't you? And it's putting you on a dead run. Well, we all know that's a misery. At best, you've got to pull something out. And you've got to dance around the foredeck, the old dance of death, while somebody back end's trying to pull a sheet in and they're not doing it when you ask them. It's never fun when the boat's rolling about and you're short-handed. So if you can avoid that, do. Come up onto a broad reach and sail along for a while. Go along for 12 hours if you like, because the wind will probably change in the end. And if it doesn't, you can jibe and go back again. Um, by all means, pole out if you've got good gear for doing it and you can do it sensibly. That's great. But don't feel you've got to stay on a dead run if just because the wind's blowing that way. Deep water sailors don't do that. They recognise they've got a long way to go and the wind will change sooner or later. So that was absolutely brilliant advice. Stick with that and you won't go far wrong. Now, David from Poole has asked me a tricky question. I'm going to read the whole question out because I, I think it'll interest you. And it'll apply to an awful lot of us. Every few years when our flares go out of date, oh no, another big bill. Do I really need them? Do they work when they're out of date? Well, we all know that they do, don't we? But we get advice that we have to get rid of them straight away because everybody's making sure that when they're given advice, they're not going to have somebody come back at them and say the one flare in a hundred backfired. Um, if it's very old, don't have anything to do with it. And my advice is to, uh, the official advice is to get rid of them and get some new ones when they run out, when the, when the expiry date is left. But here's the, here's, the, here's the question. At present, I have out-of-date flares on board. Should I replace them? As I have two fixed RTs, radio telephones, and a handheld VHF on board, plus a PLB on my life jacket. That's something that tells everybody where you are when you've fallen in. I spoke to an RLI station manager at the Southampton Boat Show a couple of years ago, and he recommended that I don't need flares at all as they can be almost as dangerous as the incident given that most people don't have enough experience in using them safely under pressure. Well, that's an interesting point, isn't it? A year later, I spoke to another RNLI manager. His view was that I needed handheld flares, as these are very useful for search and rescue units to visually locate a casualty during a search. I think that's a very interesting point. Um, if you're going ocean, you've probably got to have some parachute flares on board and hope there's somebody close enough to see them. But if you're sailing coastal, I'm not sure that you really need those now. We've got such good, um, such good VHF radios that even if you're climbing into the life raft, you've probably got your hand held in your, probably got your hand held in your pocket. So that should look after you. Um, the point that the RNLI made about locating you with a handheld flare, I think is a really important one. If you're out in the Solent, for example, and there's boats all around you, it's a sunny summer's afternoon and you have a medical emergency and the helicopter's coming off to, to, to coming out to, to, to winch somebody off. They need to spot you straight away and there's loads of boats out there. You say, oh, I've got a nice white boat, it's 40 feet long and it's got a blue dodger. Ah, great, good luck to you, mate. There's dozens of them. What you need is a handheld flare and probably a handheld smoke in that situation. Let that off and there's no doubt about who you are. It doesn't cost much to do that. So I would always have those flares handy and have them on board. And here's another little tip. You can buy now really high intensity electric flares. You don't have to set anything off that might backfire or burn you or anything else. You just simply open it up and fire it. And they're incredibly bright and they work well. So a red one of those tucked away in your flare pack might be a really useful thing and perhaps try that first if in any doubt if you're a bit wary about the others. So think on that as well and they last a long time. They've got their own batteries and they last for an awful lot longer than the uh, pyrotechnics do. So having one of those handy is good too. Right, Peter in the West Country wants me to comment on the accuracy of GPS and how we might be misled by it and associated electronic charts compared with the old skills of pilotage and coastal navigation. Yeah. Well, I write about this ad nauseam, and uh, I talk about it a lot as well on some of my uh, YouTube videos. I think 
two things can happen with GPS navigation. When we're sailing in home waters, it's pretty accurate really. It's as accurate as the chart we're using. There are two things that can happen with GPS. One is that you get what's called a datum shift. Now a datum shift occurs when the GPS puts out its position in its own datum for the chart. We're not talking about tidal chart datums here, we're talking about horizontal datums, the lat long datum to which the chart was drawn. Nowadays almost all British charts are drawn to WGS 84 and so is GPS. GPS works to WGS 84 which is a world geodetic system that works for an awful lot of Western countries now. If it's giving you a position on that and your chart plotter has got WGS 84 charts on, which it probably has, then the position should be right to the length of your boat or something like that, which is all you're ever going to want. Quite frankly, if it's right to 50 yards, I'm grateful. But um, if you're somewhere else other than in Britain, and in a few places still in the far-flung parts of Britain, it may be working to a different datum, the old British datum, for example. And if it is, it could be 100 or 200 metres out uh, if the datum is different. So you need to be careful about that. The second thing that can go wrong is the question of layering. Now, if you've got a bulkhead chart plotter or you're using perhaps a Navionics app on your iPad or something like that, as you zoom in, you'll have noticed that you get more and more detail. As you zoom out, the detail disappears. Now, therein lies the problem. They have to do it that way because otherwise when you look at the whole chart you wouldn't be able to see anything because it's just covered in stuff. So they have to do it, they have to layer things out. Now you don't decide what's layered out unless you're very very careful and you're pretty clever with the menus. It's decided for you by some guy who's got a whole lot of data and he's piling it in there and as like as not he's not a cartographer. When you scale in on a raster chart that's a chart that's basically a scan of a paper chart, what you see is what you get. There's nothing hidden. So that if you haven't got enough information for what you want, you get the next chart out of the chart table or you call up the next raster chart and that gives you more detail until finally you've got everything. At that point you've got no overview. So you have to decide which chart you want. But this is the reality. This is real life. You can't go wrong with this system if you're using a paper chart. If you're using a vector-driven chart, which is what most of the charts on our chart plotters are, then as you go out, things disappear. But you don't know what's disappeared. You can't tell, except unless you zoom in. And you can't always zoom in for everywhere. If you're going to somewhere that's 10 miles away and you want to imagine where you're going to go, you probably imagine a straight line. But if you're doing what I was told when I first went to sea, you're not steering in a straight line if you're in a sailing boat. If you're a motorboat, you are. And you're probably going along and unless the tide's setting you off, you can basically plan a passage on the vector chart, zoom in to the bits you're going to be going over and see what there is there. But if you're in a sailing boat you can't do that because sailing boats do not go in a straight line. They never have and they never will. You watch them in the America's Cup. They're all over the place aren't they? All they're really trying to do is go from A to B. But that's what the rest of us do. So you can't really plan your passage on a vector chart. You need to get a paper chart out to look at that. So that is the difficulty with the charts that you have on your chart plotter. It's really important to understand this. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, but we need to understand it and be ready for it. And then we're OK. Next question from Richard in Hamble. Richard wants to know, he says he's planning his first trip to the Sillies. What are the key things we should consider? Well, <laughs> my wife and I were looking at these questions over lunch and she had a good laugh. She said, well, she said, the main thing to consider if you're going to the Sillies is the weather. Don't go there if it's not going to be a lovely day. And that has been my experience. That the Sillies is absolutely wonderful. It's, it's like being in the Caribbean. There are white sand beaches. The sea's clear. There's very often not too many people around. The walks ashore are gorgeous and the islands are idyllic and as you look to seaward from the seaward side of Briar and you look at that great rockscape you really are seeing the wonders of the Lord. It's a great place to go and the people are good too and there's some great seamen there who actually work the water. In fact everybody who lives in the Sillies is a bit of a seaman, it's in their blood. But here's the problem. These are small islands out in the ocean. They're at the lee side of the Western Atlantic, the Western Ocean as we call it. And there's big swells coming in. And there's nowhere for them to go really. 
you can't get perfect shelter from a big sea anywhere in the Scilly Isles. You can do the best you can and there are places where you can snuck right in if you've got a shoal draft boat and get out of it. But I'm afraid if there's a big sea coming in uh, you're always going to be rolling about a bit. So if you don't like that don't go unless it's calm. Um, if you don't mind a bit of movement when you're anchored, and a lot of people don't, um, some people think it's quite fun being rocked in the cradle of the deep as they go to sleep at night. Well, that'd be fine. It won't worry you. It worries my wife. She reckons the only good anchorage is one that you can't see the sea from. And um, she's sailed halfway around the world and back, so she knows what she's talking about. But when she's in harbour, she likes to be still. So if that's you, make sure you get the right weather. Leave it out if it's blowing hard. But if it's not, get down there because you won't be sorry. Mark from Hamble. He's got a gaffer by the sound of it. And um, he says, any simple advice to better performance in gaffers uh, as they differ from Bermudan sloops, which most of us have got, when they're going upwind, reaching and downwind? Well, actually, upwind with a gaffer. The main thing is this. Like the first advice I got, don't try and steer too high. Gaffers are even worse than Bermudan rigged yachts for this. If you try and point too high, you'll get nowhere. Crack off and let her go. Let her sail. And um, you'll be fine. If you're doing six knots, 55 degrees from the wind, you're going to get there an awful lot quicker than if you're doing a four and a half at 45 and going sideways for your money. So there you are. That's the first bit of advice. The second bit is this. And this is axiomatic. You've got to have a tight jib luff. If you haven't got a tight jib luff, you might as well stay at home. And the way you do that is make sure you bobstay, because uh, folks who don't sail gaffers won't understand this, but you have a cutter rig, a real cutter, not like a Bermudan cutter like mine, where really you've got a big sail set on the forestay, on the stem head, and a little sail set inside it. Really, it's not a proper cutter, it's a slutter, a sloop with a bit of a cutter rig. But a, a, a gaff cutter is a different thing altogether. The staysail is set on the stem head. And that's a real big driving sail. And outboard of that, on the end of the bowsprit, you've got a jib. And that's slotting air around the back of the staysail and powering it up. And the staysail rips it on down the back of the mainsail. And if you stand between the staysail and the main on a good gaff cutter, it'll blow your hat off in there because of the accelerated air. But it all starts with the jib. And the jib luff must be tight because if the jib luff's tight, it'll lift the boat as it pulls. If it's sagging, as you sheet it in, you'll sheet it in further and further, it'll just sag behind the staysail, it'll start backwinding the staysail, the slot will be killed and you'll go nowhere. The way to get it tight is to make sure your bob stays tight first, that holds the bowsprit down. If the bob stays not tight, you might as well be beating the air for all the good you'll do. Nice tight bob stay and then a powerful jib halyard. On all boats I've ever had over 32 feet, you have a two-to-one purchase on the hauling end of your jib halyard. It goes up, around a block on the side of the mast, back down, through a block at the head of the jib, and back up again. And now here's the secret. If you buy a store-bought gaffer, it'll be dead-ended at the, at the, up the mast there. And that's death. You're never going to get a tight jib luff. On a proper gaffer, you have another block up there, so the halyard starts at the deck, goes up round the block, through the block on the head of the mainsail, back up, round the next block, and back down again. And on its way down, it meets the purchase. And the purchase is a four to one takel that's permanently rigged. The top block, which is a double, is literally bowlined or spliced into the halyard as it comes down. And the bottom block is a single with a becket, and that's shackled to the deck. So the block, the rope starts there, up round the top block, back down again, round again, and round the top block. Four parts coming out of the top block, that's four to one, and it's working on the two to one halyard on the jib, and that gives you eight to one. And if you're as fat as me, I weigh 200 weight. That's, uh, I don't know how many kilograms that is, but it's a tenth of a ton in old money. Uh, if I take my feet off the deck on, on eight to one, I'm putting almost a ton on that without sweating it at all. So that's the way to get a tight jib luff, and that's the way to go to windward. Now, reaching. Well, if you're reaching in a gaffer, um, you're home free, because the boat's going to go faster than all the Bermudan boats anyway, unless they've got a real slim, thin keel and they're driving it like madmen. Gaffers go beautifully on a reach. And off the wind, 
you've got the problem of pulling out a head sail. Head sails are small on gaffers, so you've probably got to put some sort of spinnaker on, uh, which is a lot of work. And pulling them out is usually awkward because you have these heavy poles. But I've got an answer to this. If you've got a decent sized staysail, this is what I did on my boat Western Man. I bought a carpet. It arrived from India and it had a big heavy bamboo pole inside it. Really hefty, sort of that big, massive, and that weighed nothing. Well, I blocked one end up and I arranged with epoxy, I put a stainless steel spike about that long in it. And the other end had a hole in and it went onto a winch on the mast. I could have just put some simple jaws on so it would just sit on the mast. And what you do is this, you put your sail out to windward, you goose wing it, it won't like it, and you do a bit of a dance here, you get your lightweight pole, you stick the spike into the clue of the sail, you shove it out and then you let it fall back onto the mast and the jaws or the hole or whatever it is will locate it on the mast and it'll stay there. It's absolutely miraculous. It'll tend to kick up a bit but you've got a lazy sheet on the sail that, you've, that, you, that you're goose winging. So you just take that down to a cleat on the foredeck, make it up and that's you. Absolutely splendid. Costs you nothing, very light, easy to rig, it's not technically right according to the RYA and letting the sheet run through the end of the pole and all that but um, you see that's very handy if you're going to be reefing the sail on a run as you do uh, in a modern yacht rolling it up a bit but you can't do that on a gaffer so forget it just pull it out like that. There you go. Now then Vanessa wants to motor across to France and she's asking whether I'd suggest doing it in a convoy with other boats for your maiden voyage. Vanessa you might not like this, but I'd say no. I'll tell you why. Uh, going across to France, uh, probably from the central southern England, is really not very difficult at all. I mean, what's the problem? You've got a simple tidal situation, which is very easy to work out. You can read that up in any book or um, huh, one of mine, if you like. Well, remember, every book sold is the price of a pint. So if you, if you want to do that, I'd be pleased. But that's what you do. Um, you set out from wherever it is you're leaving, Poole, The Needles, Chichester, uh, Littlehampton, wherever, and you've got 60 miles to go to the other side. If you're in a motorboat, that is just couldn't be easier. Um, the tide's going to more or less cancel itself out if you're doing five or six knots. You simply aim for Cherbourg, watch your plotter as you go and see which way you're being set. If you're doing 12 knots, it's only going to take you five hours, so you probably want to make an offset for the tide. The tide's the only issue, but here's the trick. Make sure you end up uptide of your destination, you, unless you're doing 20 knots, in which case it's not very important. But if you're doing 5, 6, 10, 12 knots, tide can run at 4 knots across the north coast of France, and if you're uptide when you arrive, you probably won't get your landfall perfect, and you'll be scooting in with the tide behind you. Absolutely lovely. And really, when you get to the other side, it's just like coastal navigation over here. There's no difference. And here's the thing. If you go in a convoy, if somebody else has a problem, you're going to be hanging around waiting for them. If you've got a slow boat, somebody's only doing six knots and you can do 12, you're going to be hanging around waiting for this bloke, fluffing up your injectors. You don't want to have to do that. Just do it. Go on your own and get the total satisfaction when you arrive and you arrive and they're all speaking French. What about that, eh? You've actually crossed the channel. You're in a foreign land and you've done it yourself. And believe me, it is not difficult. The first time I did it, Ros and I went across in a little 22-foot centreboard boat that we bought for under a thousand pounds. It was a long time ago. And we went across and I didn't know any of this stuff. It only did four knots, this boat, most of the time. And I ended up down tide of where I wanted to go because nobody had told me otherwise. And I ended up tacking backwards and forwards for six hours when I could have been in there in the Bardew port enjoying myself. So, you know, get it right. But I tell you what, you know, I didn't have any problems really. It was just uh, some strategic issues brought about by inexperience and lack of the sort of information we have now. Nobody had sessions like this in those days. You just did the best you could and learnt in the school of hard knocks. And my goodness, did we learn. But the idea of setting out across the channel on my own didn't bother me. I wasn't worried about that because I knew one day I'd go much further. And I don't think it should worry you either. You're okay. So long as your boat is well found, your engines are good, your fuel's clean. That's really important. Make sure you've got clean fuel and that your injectors are getting the, what they want. If they've got clean fuel, they'll go on working.
so long as your cooling system works and you're not going to foul that in mid-channel so there's nothing to worry there just make sure that your fuel tanks are clean and that you've got spare fuel filters because the only thing that can go wrong is that you foul up a fuel filter and that stops your engine uh, you'll know it's a fuel filter because it'll slow down first and you'll start waggling your throttle about and you think oh come on come on go 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 and it won't it'll slow down and then it'll die and you know you've got a foul fuel filter so here's another tip before you go make sure you know how to change your fuel filters it's not difficult It'll be even easier on a motorboat than it is on a sailing boat because they've always got the engine jammed in somewhere impossible. But you should have good access. Make sure you can change your fuel filters. Make sure you've got a couple of spares and make sure you know how to bleed the diesel system so that you can get fuel through. If you can't do that, you shouldn't be going across the channel at all. It's as simple as that. Whether you're in a convoy or whether you're not, if you're in a convoy and you've got foul fuel and it stops your engine, well, what's going to happen? I don't know, somebody's going to tell you how to do it. Much better if you've found out how to do it first, because that's what will stop you, nothing else will. So there you go. Regarding the, the shipping lanes, it's just the usual rule of the road. If you've got an AIS, use it. Otherwise, my advice is if you see a ship and it's on a steady bearing, never mind who's right of where it was, just turn a bit and go under his stern. It's the safest thing to do, he'll appreciate it, and it's no trouble for you, especially if you've got 12 knots available, but even if you're doing six. No worries, really. So there you are. Don't worry too much about the shipping lanes. Just give way to people. Do it in daylight. Go in the middle of the summer. You've got 15 hours of daylight. You'll get across easily in that. Leave on the last of the ebb if you're going down from Yarmouth, but if you're going from anywhere else, don't worry about that. Just go when you can. So there you are. That was a long answer, wasn't it? But I think it's an important answer from Vanessa because it applies to all of us. Um, you know, if we're going under motor, under sailing boats, um, make sure you can keep the motor running. And that's what'll stop it. Fuel or cooling, nothing else. Mike in the West Country. I like this question. He says, what advice would you give to someone looking to cross to Biscay for the first time? I want to add a sail to my boat. Currently, she only has a self-tacking jib. Well, that's two questions, isn't it? OK, here we go. We should have a map up here really, but we haven't and we'll manage as best we can. Um, the first advice is this, cross the channel, get yourself into Camaray on the northwest corner of France. You drop down inside Ushant, go down the Chanel du Four. That looks awful on the chart, uh, honestly it does. You, you look at that, I mean when I was a young yacht delivery skipper, um, Mike, uh, you know, for several trips I wouldn't go through there because I thought, oh dear, that looks terrible, I'm not going in there. And I went round Ushant, which was a really bad idea because there's all these ships and it gets foggy out there. I didn't like it. And um, after a while I plucked up courage and I went down the Chanel du Four. And do you know, it's like going down Broadway when you get in there. There's loads of room, especially if you've got a chart plotter, it's dead easy. So um, that's the first thing. Go down through there and get you, in fact, you know, if the tide's wrong, uh, when you get there, go into Labavrac, and that's a lovely place. They've got a marina there now, so you can pop in there if you want, but I'd generally pick up a mooring. Anyway, whatever you do, get yourself to that northwest corner of France. If you're in Labavrac, you can take the next tide down the Chanel du Four. Have an evening in Labavrac, it's lovely. Nice little restaurants there, little bistros. Um, then in the morning, off you go down the Chanel du Four. Get yourself down to Camaray, uh, which is at the south end of the Chanel du Four. Um, and it's the jumping off point for the Ras de Seine, which is another of these great tide rips that rubs out into the Bay of Biscay. It's not far from Camaray, easy in a tide, no problem at all. And wait there until the weather serves you. Now, these days we have wonderful weather services, don't we? And you've got decent internet in Camaray, so no problem there. Tune in and have a look at passage weather or whatever it is you're getting your weather from. And wait in Camaray till you've got three clear days. Make it four, because you can never be sure. Make sure you've got a good weather slot and then go for it. Don't mess about. If you're going too slow, start your engine and use it. You're dragging your propeller. You might as well have some benefit for it. You're lugging all that weight around the ocean. Don't be shy. Start it up if you want, if you're on passage. Get yourself down there. It shouldn't take more than three days. It's about 400 miles to one of those nice little rears from Camaray.
first one just round Cape Finisterre is my favourite. Go in the first one when you get round the corner and it's lovely. You'll knock it off in no time. But the trick is to pick your weather. You don't want to get hammered in the Bay of Biscay, it's not nice. I've, I, I've crossed the Biscay many times. Twice I've been absolutely walloped, really walloped. One time I was in a very old boat that nearly sank and I thought I was going to lose my life. Uh, the other time I was in a well-found boat but it wasn't much fun. So you don't want that. Pick your right weather and it's dead easy. It's wonderful. You might see a lovely big swell walloping in from the Western Ocean. And that's lovely as you just go up and down that and sail along and you really feel you're at sea at last. It's grand. So that's the advice to crossing Biscay. Second question, he's only got a self-tacking jib at the moment. Self-tacking jibs are interesting. I've got a couple of things to say about these. Um, people use them a lot in the Baltic because in the Baltic you're sailing amongst islands a great deal and you find yourself slop slop slopping down the channels. You need to uh, you need to be able to tack quickly and easily and not, you certainly don't want to be grinding in great big genoas every time because you're probably tacking every minute or two. You want something easy so you just go flop 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 and it's great. They're wonderful. There's a drawback though. When you're reaching, if you just let the sail out like you would normally, um, because the sail's so tall and narrow, it's always the same with tall narrow sails, you ease the sheet, the clue lifts, and you start spilling wind out the top of the sail. This is a really bad thing about self-tacking sails and I've talked to the people who build these boats and I've said to them look why don't you just rig a barber hauler on it it's dead easy you just put a little block outboard on the rail on both sides and you have a fairly light piece of dynema that runs from the clue one piece either side down through this block and back to the cockpit. That's it. When you're tacking short you get all the benefits of that wonderful self-tacking jib and when you're on a reach you let, the, you let the sail out, the clue lifts and you get this barber hauler and you heave it down. As you heave it down you see the sail come into shape, the twist is controlled and you can feel the boat accelerate. It's amazing but they won't do it. I spoke to one manufacturer of these boats said why do you do this? He said oh people don't want that complication our boats are simple. Well they might be simple but they're slow mate and that's why. So get yourself a barber hauler if it's not on the boat rig yourself one. Both sides cheap as chips. Doesn't have to be expensive just a piece of old string will do it and that's you sorted. So if you're going across Biscay and you didn't want to buy a new sail and you're on a reach that would get you there. Let's suppose it gives you quarter of a knot only and you're doing six knots. A quarter of a knot is one hour in 24 at six knots. Six fours are 24. One hour in 24, that's six miles. So by the time you get to Cape Finisterre, you've saved three hours. It might get you in before sunset and you'll be sailing into that rear on a lovely sunset evening and everything will be fine. Get your pick down and pour yourself a drink because you deserve it. And if you arrive three or four hours later because you didn't have a barber hauler, look what's happened to you. You're crawling in in the dark. Oh goodness, is there anything in here? Is there something in my way? I can't see. Um, what's going to happen? I don't know. It's not very well lit. You don't want that. And you can save yourself all that time by that simple means. If you want to really go fast, well, the answer is this. You do what I've done this year. Uh, I've got fed up with my heavy number one Genoa on my boat. It's great, but it's hard to wind in. Uh, it's not for short tacking, but nothing I do is going to be for short tacking. Uh, but what I want is something that will work in light air, something in less than 10 knots, because the sail's not much good. It could do with being a bit bigger in those conditions, but not when the wind pipes up. That's the trouble with roller jibs. They're not good for everything. And um, what I've done, I've bought myself a Code Zero. I've been down to Pete Sanders at Lymington. I've asked him what shape it should be and what weight it should be and he's advised me. I mean, good knows, I'm a lifelong sailor. I should know what I want and I do, but I'm always prepared to listen to somebody else, you know. But Pete has made me a Code Zero. This is a much bigger, lightweight sail for setting in probably winds of under 12 knots, I would imagine. It goes up on a roller, uh, its own roller, so that when I'm sick of it, I just pull a string and it disappears. When I want it, it's easy to hoist. Uh, it just comes out of the bag, shackle the bottom roller on outside the Genoa, send the other one up and it's halyard and pull the string and I've got this wonderful sail. You obviously get rid of the Genoa and the boat accelerates beyond what you can imagine. A really, really worthwhile investment. So, and you can pole it out of course on the other side if you want, but I'd be inclined to pole out the Genoa because if you're going down across Biscay and you've got a following wind, and I've done this, uh, you're sailing along and you want to reduce sail 
and you've got a big pole out, you've got a fore guy on it, an after guy and a topping lift, as you should have if you're going a long way. Well, you don't want to take all that off, do you? You're going to roll the Genoa up inside. Just ease the sheet and roll it away. And it'll roll away and roll away with the pole set like that and it'll be perfect. No hassle at all. You can do that quite a lot before you have to start reefing the main. And if you're running downwind and you've got your main vanged out, you don't want to be pulling that in and you certainly don't want to be rounding up if you've got this pole on. So what are you going to do? And that leads us to another question. I've got a question. Here it is from Vincent on the East Coast. Vincent, this is your answer. I'm going to read you out Vincent's question, but it actually goes well with that last one. Vincent says, the unspoken question in sailing, how to reef the main on a run. You're on a great downwind run with the main fully out. The forecast is maximum 20 knots. The sea's picked up, followed by the swell, and you've left it too late to reef. We've all been there, haven't we? Turning into wind could be dangerous. Well, it might be, or at least it's going to be inconvenient. Googling this produces almost no answers, and it's not covered in any books that I've found. I think it's covered in one of mine, actually. But, um, uh, and then he goes on to explain when it happened to him. And I'm very sympathetic, Vincent, because it's happened to all of us. Well, this is what you do. If you've got um, an in-boom reefing system like mine, you're stuck. There's not a lot you can do. You've got to spill the wind out of that sail to reef it. Um, if you've got an in-mast reefing system, you might be able to reef it on a run, so long as you get it in in good time. But it's usually better to let it, let it feather, let it, let it luff a bit. This doesn't mean you've got to go head to wind, but you've got to come high enough to let the sail wobble, to let the sail wind bow both sides of it. A close reach will do it. 60 degrees off the true wind is usually fine to reef, but it's not the answer to your question. And here is the answer. You need to have slab reefing. If you've got slab reefing, some decent winches and a good crew, you can do it. And I did it sailing across Biscay one time. Ha! I was in a, a great boat. It was about 40 feet long. We had a Genoa pulled out and we had the main on the other side all vanged out. We had a grand crew. We had uh, a lady owner. We had a tugboat skipper um, who hadn't done much sailing but was a prime seaman. And we had a man who was a roustabout on the oil rigs and he knew what to do with a piece of string. He was terrific. These were athletic, strong guys but not expert sailors. And here's how we reefed that main. Take up the slack on the topping lift and leave the boom right where it is. Don't touch it. You might be able to pull it in a bit, ease the preventer and just pull it in a little way to get it off the sprout, off the shrouds and the uh, spreaders if it's that far out. Very carefully, ease your halyard. The sail will start to collapse and, and get into a mess and start to get into the shrouds. Get the, uh, the tack end down quickly. You're not letting it all the way down. You're letting a little way down. But the important thing is the guy on the clue pennant, the aft end of the sail, the man on the pennant, he's winding the winch as you ease the main halyard. And that pulls the sail back onto the boom and keeps it out of all the gubbins. It stops it getting wrapped up in the shrouds. You can heave the tack down as you go. So you need a couple of people to do this. In fact, three is better, but if you've got two of you, you can manage, especially if you've got a system I'm going to describe in a moment for reefing a mainsail from the cockpit. So down it comes bit by bit, and you keep it off the shrouds until you've got the tack cringle on its horn or bows down tight. You then set the halyard up and finish off on the clue pennant. And if you do that, it works. It's not convenient and it's not ideal, but it's a lot better than rounding up. So that's what you do. Don't be afraid. It will, the sail will try and get itself wrapped up, but don't let it. And the secret is the person on the clue pennant. So that's the answer to that one. And this brings up another question. This is from uh, Rhys, on the, also on the East Coast. And I see all you guys from the East Coast. I'm sorry I kept talking about the Solent, but I'm a, uh, I'm a Solent man, even though my boat's in a lockdown in a shed in the Baltic at the moment. But uh, um, it sort of comes naturally, really. But I love the East Coast. I've had some grim nights down the wallet, I can tell you. But uh, I, 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 I love it. I love to sail up the black water and see the barges coming out in hardly enough water to float me. It's a great thing. You guys know what you're up to over there. So what have we got here? Reese, is modifying slab reefing setup to enable sheeting and reefing control from the cockpit sensible? Yes, it is. Getting a bit older and wanting to adapt sensibly. Well, I bet you're not as old as me, Reese. You've already got your clue pennant led aft to the cockpit, probably. If you haven't, you need to rig turning blocks 
There'll be turning blocks probably in the forward end of the boom already. If there aren't, you might have to dangle them. But you bring your reefing pennants forward through the turning blocks and then you have some turning blocks at the deck or some sort of roller that you can put the rope round that'll just roll. Bring that back and have a winch on the coach roof that you can wind it down. That's your clue. A lot of boats are rigged that from scratch and that's great. If yours isn't, you'll have to organise that. Now, here's the real secret. Don't have anything to do with single line reefing. It is the invention of the devil. Don't let anybody tell you it's great because some people make it work, but I've had bad experiences with it. Um, there are all sorts of problems with it. Uh, one problem is that you end up with 500 miles of rope in the cockpit that you probably don't want. You have to wind your winch forever. And um, if they've put cheap rope on it, which manufacturers invariably do, except if it's a really big boat, um, it's made of polyester. You get it all reefed down and half an hour later the polyester's stretched and the reef's gone to rats. And it's not worth topping, so you have to wind it all down again. And then, when you want to shake the reef out, the cheap block in the back end of the boom will be not running properly. And you'll have to get up, stand near the end of the boom and pull it through. You're pulling against the muscle of your shoulder. You'll probably strain your shoulder. It is a wretched business. I hate it. Um, there'll be people out there with rustlers and all sorts of very good boats that have got it. And you'll probably hate me for saying this, but this has been my life's experience. It's much more sensible to do it this way. You've got your clue sorted as we've described. Now then, what about the tack? Well, people imagine that the tack has to be done from the mast. There's probably a ram's horn there that you can put a cringle round or something like that. Um, no need for that. Just get a short length of dynema, tie it to the cringle, to each cringle, so it's already rigged. Bring it down through some sort of lead at the forward end of the boom so that when it's pulled down tight, it will pull the sail to the front end of the boom. Bring it down through a turning block at deck level or through this big roller I'm talking about so it's got an easy fair lead and bring it back to the cockpit. You almost certainly won't need a winch for this because it's never hard pulling a forward end of the sail down is it when you're reefing pulling the tack down you just pull it down and hook it over the horn. So if you've got a piece of rope you'll be able to pull it down for sure. So piece of dynema, pull it down and cleat it off somewhere or have a jammer or anything. Then you can do the whole thing from the cockpit. You just bring her onto a close reach, sails flogging, topping lift on, ease the halyard. As the halyard comes down you pull on your bit of dynema and pull the tack down. Cleat it off, jam it off, whatever you're going to do and then wind down the clue till it's nice and tight. You've got a nice tight foot. Job done. And then you're home free. Ease off the topping lift and off you go. You've set the halyard up already because you did that while you were doing the tack. And it's just so easy. And why on earth manufacturers don't do this instead of this single line reefing? I do not know. I understand why people don't want to leave the cockpit. I don't either. I've got to that time of life and I've got my boat rigged so that um, I've got in-boom reefing. And that works really well for us sailing not across the world but just sailing coastal cruising. Absolutely brilliant. So um, yes, do get your boat rigged so you don't have to leave the cockpit. It's so, so worth it. Oh, here's one. Roger in Hamble. Ha <laughs> ha! Roger, can you suggest a good yard that specialises in replacing teak decking at a reasonable price? Yes, I can, Roger. I have this problem. I've got a 44-foot boat. I bought her in America. Well, I went all the way to, to Florida to buy this boat and I'd asked the broker before I left, I said, uh, tell me, is the deck in good condition? Is that a teak deck? And I know about teak decks. I've had a lot of disappointment. I didn't want to have to replace the deck for the price they were asking. And he said, oh yeah, it's wonderful. So I went over there and the deck was like a ploughed field. It was rubbish. It was worn out. Completely hopeless. It had to go. So I gave him a hard time and I said, look, I've spent thousands of pounds getting here to look at this boat and you've brought me here under false pretenses. What have you got to say for yourself? I can't buy this boat. And he said, well, you can. He said, this is what you do. The seller's desperate. He said, offer him whatever you want to pay for the deck, to get a new deck when you get it home. And he said, uh, that's what you do. I said, all right, because I want the boat. I loved the boat. She was great except for the deck. And I offered the bloke what it was going to cost me, I thought. And um, he said, yeah, all right, tore my arm off and I bought the boat. So that was it. I had some money in the bank and I had a deck that wanted replacing. So I got home and I know a bit about the marine industry, as you can imagine. I've been knocking around for 50 years and um, I know a lot of people. So I did a lot of research to try and find out what was the best way to get this done. And I was getting quotes 
from the south coast that were really outside my budget. I'd made a guess and they were, they were a lot of money. They were more than I'd budgeted, a lot more, like 30% more. So my wife started snooping around and in the end she rang a bloke in North Wales who specialises in teak decks. And he quoted her over the phone for the boat. He knew what the boat looked like and he quoted her over the phone. And um, his quote was 60% of the best quote that I'd had from down here. And um, so I rang him up and said, look, what's going to happen if we find there's some problems under the deck? He said, I've had a look at it. I win some, I lose some. I'll take that chance. He said, I think your boat will be all right. I've looked up how she's built and I think she'll be all right. I'll take the chance. And so we struck a deal. Um, it was the middle of winter. So I put my boat on the truck. It was going to be cheaper to do that than take it to North Wales. And she went to North Wales on the truck. And there she was met by this wonderful man, my saviour, Barry Lovell. Lovell, L-O-V-E-L-L. -L, operating an outfit called TLC Boat Care. And he's operating in North Wales in Conway. They pulled the boat off the trailer straight into his shed. He's got a nice shed there. And he and his excellent young man put me a deck on. Ten years ago they did it. I haven't had to touch it. It's absolutely spot on. And I've recommended him to many people and I'm recommending him to you now. Let's have another question. Being very new to boating, Steve says in Pool, where's a good place to travel from Pool on our powerboat, putting our newly learnt navigation skills into practice? Well, Steve, I'd say the same to you as I'd say to anybody who's not very experienced. Start with what you know and get to know it well so that you're confident, so that you can get your boat in and out of the berth with confidence, so that you know the rule of the road, you know who you have to give way to and who not to give way to. Uh, you understand your basic boys, you've obviously learnt all that, well done, good for you. And you want to start to make passages. Well, the first place to go from Poole is quite simply Studland Bay. That gets you out of Poole Harbour, down the Long Channel, and it gets you to actually anchor in fairly open water in good shelter if the wind's westerly. Do that, have a picnic, and then go home in the evening, go back to your berth. And if you're living on board, fine for the weekend, have a nice dinner on board or go to the pub, and then do it again the next day, so that you're confident. And then next weekend, you can really spread your wings, because you've done something special, you've been outside Pool Harbour, that'll make you feel good about yourself. The next one is a little bit more ambitious, because wherever you go, you're gonna have some questions to ask. Uh, if your boat's very shoal drafted, you might be able to go to Christchurch. That's fairly easy. Get a good pilot book. I do the Shell Channel pilot. Highly recommended. And I've just done uh, a passage plan for MDL for a YouTube video uh, that you'll find on MDL's site or on my YouTube channel. And you'll find that that tells you about planning a passage from the Hamble River to Chichester Harbour. Have a good look at that video because it's all in there what you have to do. I could go through it all here, but I don't think there's any point really, because it's on the video. Look at the video uh, and inwardly digest what's in there. I would say that for you, you could either go to Christchurch if you've got shoal draft, or you could go up to the Solent. You could go to, you could go to Yarmouth, book yourself a berth in there because they get busy, or go into Lymington, where they've got a fine new town quay with lots of lovely berths. Uh, neither of them is tidally sensitive, but you'll need to have the tide going with you up the Needles Channel. So work on that, make sure you get it right. Or if you don't fancy going that way, maybe you've got a light easterly breeze and you don't want to be banging around, um, go to Weymouth instead. I love Weymouth. Or perhaps go down to Lulworth Cove and anchor. Or even duck in behind Moop Rocks and anchor in there. It looks hairy, but it's not. It's a wonderful place to go, and there'll be nobody in there, or just one or two boats. Anchor, wait for the tide, and then come home again. Or perhaps come round back to Studland. Anchor for the night, and then go in home, and you've had a real proper little cruise. But if you go to Weymouth, you'll feel like a hero. It's easily done in a tide, even with a sailing boat. So um, that would be my advice. Weymouth's lovely. It's a great place to go. It's like a continental harbour. You, you tie up in the middle of the port there, and you can step ashore, get fish and chips, and lots of nice restaurants or good pubs, uh, if they let us in them. I expect they will by then, by the summer. Let's hang in for better weather. So that's that one. Um, what have we got here? Peter from Southampton says, do you consider the use of paper charts and sextant to continue to decline and eventually be consigned to museum status? Well, Peter, I think 
if we're all alive in a hundred years time, I think we have to face the fact that I think a paper chart by then will be a museum piece. Right now, emphatically, it is not. And if you look at my passage flooding video, you'll see why. As for the sextant, there are all these people now sailing off across the Atlantic on the Ark, and half of them, they think they can do a plot, but I'm an ocean examiner, and I've seen people come to get examined uh, for their ocean ticket, and they have to come in and show me that they can do astro. And um, you have to be a little bit forgiving these days, because honestly, I see some plots on those charts, looks like a spider's walked all over it, and if I move the goalposts a little bit as an examiner, they don't know what they're talking about. So a lot of people who have actually Paris their Yachtmaster theory and have not done any for a year or two, have forgotten it. So I think if I was going off across the ocean again, which I certainly will be, I love ocean sailing and I love to be out there under the stars. Um, I don't have much of a radio. I went to Greenland recently with a couple of shipmates and all we had was a VHF. And the nearest human was 100 miles away when we were up Scoresby Sound and there was nobody else between us and the North Pole. And I was perfectly happy because I was having an adventure. If anything went wrong, it was up to us to sort it out ourselves, and we did, and we could, and that's how we should look at these things. But if you want, you can have a radio and talk to other people, and you can have a GPS that will tell you where you are, more or less, all the time. And that's your adventure down the tube, really. If you don't have a GPS and you use a sextant, there's a wonder about it. You're hooked up to the heavens to find out where you are, and that's what they do. And there's only you and the stars wheeling to know where you're going to be. And when the islands come up out of the ocean after sailing 3,000 miles, only you and your art, it is a most wonderful thing using a Victorian instrument that you can completely understand rather than an electronic box that somebody's put together and you haven't got a clue what's in there. I haven't. I'm grateful for it sometimes. It's nice to have. It makes my life easy. But it rips the romance out of seafaring. So I think for a long time now, people are still going to be using sextants purely for the joy of it. But there's something else. If I'm entirely reliant on this thing that I don't understand and it goes wrong, I can have four of them on board and something can go wrong with the satellites. I feel incredibly vulnerable. I don't want to commit my safety and my life to something I don't understand and about which I can do nothing. I would rather be in charge of my own destiny. Right, let's see what we've got here. Ah, Elizabeth from Southampton. Elizabeth would like to buy a sailing yacht for using in the Solent that would also be suitable for blue water cruising as and when we have time to spare. What bilge keeler? I like the security of bilge keels. What do you suggest on a budget of about £50,000? Well, Elizabeth, cool. I'm not going to give you a straight answer to that because, you know, for sailing around the Solent, especially if you like drying out, and if you're into security from bilge keels, it must be because you like drying out, then um, I would say get yourself a bilge keeler. And I wouldn't spend £50,000 on one. I'd spend, I don't know, 20, 25, 28, and I'd buy myself something really nice, like a 33-foot westerly fulmar or something like that, that's going to sail jolly well, it's got nice accommodation, well built, and you'll have change out of 25 grand. You can bank 25,000 pounds, which you can then spend foolishly. Imagine the fun you can have with 25,000 pounds. Or you can tuck it away somewhere, you don't get much interest now, put it in premium bonds, you might get lucky. And then when the time comes for the blue water sailing, trade in the Fulmar, you won't have lost any money on it, and there'll always be somebody to buy a good one, and then spend 50,000 quid on a boat with a deep keel to go ocean sailing. You don't want a bilge keeler on the deep water. You'll hear it knocking underneath. It'll be annoying. It won't be quite so good on the stability front. It won't point so well. It's got everything against it. You get all the downsides and none of the benefits. And in the Solent, you get all the benefits and not many of the downsides. So that's my advice. Get a nice bilge keeler, sensible size. Don't spend all your money. Save the rest. You might get lucky with it. And then buy yourself a nice deep water cruiser when the time comes. Perfect. Tom, that, that was truly fantastic and, and incredibly interesting. And I'm sure everyone feels exactly the same way. 
Um, now, I've, I've, I don't know if everyone is aware or not aware, but essentially, if you did enjoy listening to that, which I'm sure you did, um, it is worth noting there is lots of content from Tom on the MDL website and on the MDL YouTube channels. And I probably shouldn't be plugging Tom's own um, YouTube channel and all his own stuff, because I'm sure you're all followers anyway. However, he does have a fantastic subscription service, which if you're not um, joined up to, it is worth a shout, because then you can get this sort of stuff any time you want. Um, but thank you ever so much for joining us. And um, hopefully, Tom, you may be in a position to do something similar again. I really hope so, because I love doing it. It's just such a joy to share what I have with, with, with my friends. We're all friends out there. We're all brothers and sisters. Perfect. Right. So I'll say again, thank you ever so much. And the good news is this year's voting season looks like it's going to be getting better and better as the vaccine rolls out and restrictions lift. So here is to a fantastic 2021 to 2022. Thank you all ever so much. isn't it and do the best we can